Father, as we get into your word, as we just seek your wisdom, seek your heart, seek your purpose, seek your will to know everything about you, just bring the new revelation, not just general revelation, but revelation <coughs> specific to who we are in you and how we can be closer to you intimately and be in right standing with you in every which way and to honor you through the whole process in Jesus' name. Beginning verse 1. For now we're going to read the first nine verses. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. That you might do them. Right off the bat, two expectations. Moses and then Joshua, the expectation from God is that they are to be taught. That same expectation is for us today to teach the things of the Lord. The commandments, statutes, and the judgments of God. It's our command to teach them. But here's the second expectation, that you might do them. They can't do without knowing. But you cannot take the doing apart from the knowing. In a relationship, when you know something, it's now become your responsibility to do. If I know my wife has a certain expectation of me, it's my job, my responsibility to do it. Sometimes I do a great job of it, sometimes not so good, and that's when I have to say I'm sorry and repent. But it's now my responsibility to do. So there's that expectation in a relationship that you might do them where? In the land where you are going over to possess it. So when you cross into where God has you, the expectation is you're going to do the expectations of God, the things that God has established. It's easy to do things and stay obedient when you're striving for something. These, I have to follow these instructions, A, B, C, and D. One, two, three, you know, so I can finish the product. But once I finish assembling the product, I've got to honor what I assembled. It's easy to be obedient when things are not clear and you're looking for direction. You're looking for purpose. You're looking for a way to get to where you want to go. It becomes harder because you're battling complacency when you get there. It becomes harder because now it's a new thing and you're shifting. You've also all of a sudden shifted from a routine, and in this case with the Israelites, that they've been doing for 40 years into a whole new routine entering the promised land. So he's reminding them, just because things look different, just because you're in a new environment, just because your routine has to shift, does not mean the foundation changes. Does not mean God's statutes, God's commands, God's judgments change. They're truth. <coughs> truth does not change no matter how many people try to convince you of it. If 100 people try to tell you the one person, the sky is red when it's blue, it's not going to change the sky to be red. The truth is the truth. So that you and your sons and your grandson might fear the Lord your God. Maintain that state of awe and reverence and love for the Lord your God. To keep all the statutes and the commands which I command you. Now twice. You should be tired of me saying this. Anytime the Bible repeats itself, you know he's serious. <laughs> me serious the first time. But when it's twice, it's driving a point home. 
all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it might be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You will teach them, second time, teach them. How? Diligently. To teach something diligently is intentional. It's purposeful. You're not just flippantly saying, oh, just push A, B, and C. Push these buttons and you got it. You're sitting with them. You're teaching them make, till they know it. Till they know it. And you are diligent in your effort to be the instructor that the student will know everything about what you are teaching. They need to know. It's diligent. It's it includes patience and it can't be separated from the Spirit of God. It can't when it comes to the things of God. To your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. Listen to this. And when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. <laughs> you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What is he saying there? These things that we are to be taught and we are to be teaching, these things of God are so important and valuable that they should be impacting every area of our lives, <clears throat> right? You, what does he say? You will teach them diligently and you, when you sit down, so when you're sitting having lunch, iron sharpening iron. You're talking, what is God doing? What has God shown you today? How is God ministering to you? What are the things of God? What does God say about this situation? When you're sitting on the couch, when you're going for a walk, when you're hanging out with people, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. Everything about this your life should reflect. Now, he's not saying that that's all you talk about. That's not what he's referring to. What he's talking about is that our lives reflect back the things of God. That who we are is so clear that we are obedient sons and daughters of the statutes, the commands, and the <coughs> teachings of the Lord. That our lives reflect that back. So when I sit down for a cup of coffee with a stranger, before they leave that cup of coffee, they're going to know where I stand and who I am. That when somebody comes into my home, they're meant to feel the presence of God. Why? Because I've established the foundation that as for me and my house, we worship the Lord. That when I go into the office, not because I said anything, but because of the Spirit of God in me and because I choose to walk away from certain things, it's going to impact how people socialize in my workplace, especially when I'm around. Not that I'm asking them to change, but the things that God is doing in my life is influencing them. Every part of my life needs to reflect the holiness of God. Every part of my life, the commands of God. How I honor somebody in the dark or in the light. How I treat somebody in the dark or in the light. My worship, everything about me has to do it. That's what he's encouraging to do. You, got, you know, after a few incidents, obviously, uh, with, the, with the golden calf and things like that, Israel sort of finally started to get it kind of right. They woke up sort of for the rest of the way. But I'm saying, don't stop that. 
just because now you're going to be in your own cities in the promised land. You're not going to be in a long caravan. It's even more important to do that. To stay true to what, what God has you and what God is doing in your life. Talk about three quick things here. I kind of jokingly title this message, The Good Life. So how do I live the good life? Part one, obedience leads to life. He says, now this is my commandment, the statutes and judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded you to teach, that you might do them in the land where you are going over, so that your sons and grandsons might fear the Lord your God, keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life. This is the expectation. God desires to us to have the best possible life. Obedience leads to life. He wants God wants us positioned to have the best life possible. Don't mistake the best life possible in God's eyes as the easiest life possible. Easy is not always the best. Just ask any one of the 12 disciples and those that came up after them. But I don't think any one of them regretted the life they lived for Jesus and the stand they took. Good life, godly life, is not necessarily an easy life, but it is a blessed life. Why is it blessed? Because no matter what it looks like, he's with me. He's with me. Somebody reminded me this week of a quote from Bill Johnson that said, the storms you can sleep through are the storms you've overcome. That's the good life. The storm is still there. The outside still looks the same. The boat is still up and down and all about. But this is at rest. This is at peace. Why? Because I, I have a personal relationship with the one who calms the storm. That's why. <clears throat> For me to succeed in these things where God is leading me, because all this is about God leading me. I know with the men's group last week, we talked about that. what is good and what is God's best. Sometimes what is good is good, but it's not necessarily God's best for us. God knows the best possible place for us. And sometimes the choices we'll make will lead, not to necessarily bad, but to not the best. It's still good, but the fullness of the blessing we might miss out on. His desire is to get us strategically exactly where we need to be, because that's his best for us. And staying true to him, to his commands, to his statutes, in that close-knit relationship gives us the best opportunity to be exactly where he, need, he wants us to be for his best. I know his best was for the Israelites to be in the promised land in se seven to ten days. Instead, they got what was good. It's because of disobedience, but those that obeyed got what is good. Verse 16 of that same chapter in Deuteronomy said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as we tested him in Massa. You should diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he commanded you. Now, it's like the third time he says this. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go and possess the good land which the land the Lord swore to you give to your fathers by driving out all of your enemies from before you. That's his best. Do what is good where God has you. Do the very best you can by being true to God's, to God's purpose for you where you are 
But as you continually seek to honor and obey, you're ready to go when he says, keep going. You're ready to move. Obedience leads to life. Second point is obedience leads to God's favor. Verse 2 it says, and that your days may be prolonged. Very similar to honoring your father and mother so that you will live long. Very similar. Who's our father? God. Honor him by being obedient to him as obedient to mom and dad and your days will be prolonged. O Israel, you, this is verse 3, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly. So not only will your days be long, because obedience keeps us in his favor, but you will multiply. You will grow. And we read in other parts of Scripture about just the heritage of your descendants and how beautiful that is and honoring that is. That you can say, you know, father of so, 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 and father of him and so. That lineage becomes valuable in the sight of the Lord. And, and it's something that is marked by his favor. Just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. A prolonged life, what does that mean? I hear so many people say, well, Social Security may not be around when I'm older, so I don't want to live past this age and blah, blah, blah. Listen, if I have to help, and I have, I want to live as long as God wants me to live. One of my personal goals, and I've shared this with my wife, is I want to see my daughter's kids. Yes. That's what I want to see. What's the best possibility for me to do that? Obviously, it's taking care of myself physically, but honoring God. Keeping his statutes, keeping his commandments. That's a promise, right? Being faithful, being obedient, that my life will be prolonged, and I and we'll multiply where we are. See, a prolonged life that is in step with the heart of God is a life that's learned to manage stress. Think about that. If stress is 80 to 85 percent involved in or the source of 85 percent of all sickness and diseases, you take away the amount of stress you have in your life, what's going to happen naturally? Your immune system is built up. Your body is stronger to fight those things. Okay? But what else are you doing? If you are doing exactly what, what he says here, that you shall uh, talk diligently to your sons, and talk when you sit down, when you walk away, when you lie down, when you rise up, bind them on your hand and the frontals of your forehead. You should write them down on the doorposts of the house, on your gates. What are you doing when you're doing that? You're setting an example for the next generation how to walk with him in faith instead of in stress. In faith instead of in fear. In faith and in courage. And boldness. When you're doing that, you're saying, and, and your child or someone says, Well, why aren't you freaking out over COVID? Mm -hmm. Why should I freak out over COVID? Because I have a God who I know I can count on. Doesn't mean I'm totally immune from COVID, but if I do my part, I'm going to trust my God to do his part. And I'm not going to be afraid and stressed hibernating in my home because that's because that's only going to make my immune system more deficient. I'm going to be wise, but I'm not going to let stress and fear hinder me. I really believe that's what happened to a lot of people that it affected them physically in such a way. And again, I'm not downplaying this. It's important. But as Christians, we walk in faith. And we trust in God. I'm not saying that on 
things we have to be wise about. But a prolonged life is a life that's so trusting in God that it sleep through the storm. Whatever that storm might look like in that moment. And I'm teaching it. When, so, when your child asks you a question, when they watch you how you deal with financial stress, when they watch you, you know, my daughter always said, when she hears us, she knows now when my wife and I are debating and debating loudly sometimes. <laughs> She's like, are you arguing? Like, yeah. But we still love each other. Yeah. And we're just talking, you know, you know, you teach that, you exemplify that, that it's okay. Because you don't want a child to think, uh-oh, stress, because something's wrong with mom and dad. You don't want your child to say, uh-oh, stress, because something is wrong with dad and God, or dad and Jesus, or mom and Jesus. Instead, you want to hear, you know, I'm trusting Jesus. This is a hard time. I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but I'm trusting Jesus. So we're going to pray together. You want to pray with me? That prolongs our life. And that prolongs his favor, keeps us in his favor. He says, be well with you. Be at peace with the things going right. Going right. <clears throat> uh, things going right, you can relax and enjoy your life, and you'll multiply. Things will multiply. Now, you may not want kids, so you may not multiply that way, but your spiritual sons and daughters will multiply from your example. Your sphere of influence will grow and multiply from your example. Who you touch will take it and go home with it. And you don't know who they're influencing with what they took from you. You don't know that. He promised the best situation and place for us if we stay true to him. And this is the final point, and this is where I want to read beginning verse 20. I want us to skip to verse 20 now. He says, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what do the testimonies and statutes and judgment mean which the Lord our God commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord, Lord brought us from Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt. Pharaoh and all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always for our good and always for our survival, as it is today. It will be righteous for us if we are careful to observe all this commandment before the Lord our God, just he, as he commanded us. Obedience leads to a generational blessing. That's my third point. The generational blessing is when you teach and your son, spiritual son, daughter, spiritual daughter, whomever your sphere of influence is, says this, why do you do what you do? Why are you the way you are? Why do you make the choices you make? Why are your commitments the way they are? We can say, well, it's because of my relationship with Jesus. They can go back to the history in Egypt and the signs, wonders, and miracles that that God did to bring freedom and to be patient with them for 40 years to lead them into the land of promise. I can look back and share my relationship with Jesus and say, here's the signs, wonders, and miracles that God has done in my life for the last 54 years. This is why I am the way I am. This is where he found me. This is where I was. This is where I struggled and where he taught me and lifted me up. This is who I am because of who he is. This is what he did. This is what he showed me. This is what he revealed to me. This is what he's doing through me. Stuff I don't understand. But it's real and it's powerful. It is passed on. And I'm standing on his promises. 
I'm standing on who he is. Because why? God is the same yesterday, today, and always. He is faithful. And when you look at this, the highest value is placed in staying in right standing with God. Stay where I'm supposed to be in my relationship with God, where I can stay, say, I am in right standing. I've been liking to use that phrase more than right, the word righteous, because I feel like sometimes the word righteous maybe it's me, makes it seem like it's way beyond me, which it is. But staying in right standing also denotes my responsibility to what I need to do. Sometimes you think of the word uh, he's righteous, you think it's just God doing it all. But to be in right standing means I'm positioning myself. I'm making willful choices, deliberate, tangible decisions. I'm putting the effort in. See, God makes me holy through his blood, through the blood of Jesus. But I can't be holy if I'm not receiving that blood. If I'm not choosing to allow him to cover me in his saving grace. I'm not achieving my potential if I'm not allowing him to pour his Holy Spirit on me and fill me up. I can still be good without the Holy Spirit just by knowing his rules, his commands, statutes, but I'm not going to be my best. There are many good people in, uh, in uh, denominational faiths who don't believe in the Holy Spirit as we do. And they're good people. And maybe good is happening in their life, but it's not the best. It's not God's best. It's not God's best. And God doesn't do things halfway. He gives you his best. He started with Jesus. Because he gave himself the best is the ultimate sacrifice. Obedience can lead to a generational blessing. It's what you pass on. Your testimony, your life, you staying true to the things of God will lead to the furtherance to the next generation and so forth. This is what's happening upstairs with our kingdom kids right now. It's awesome to see. This is what we have an opportunity to do in this town right now. This is what opportunity we have this season in our families. I know some of us are going into homes of relatives that we cringe sometimes going. We're seeing people we cringe at seeing. Or we just don't want to be near. But you know what? You have authority over what you love. Jesus, please, I beg you, give me the ability to love this person. <laughs> Give me the ability to reflect who you are. Especially to that black sheep in my family or whoever it might be. Help me. Help me. Let your, your foundation of your testimonies, your statutes, your commands that I was taught continue to the next generation in the way I teach them. Let's change that word teach to reflect them. Because we can reflect them with our lips and we can reflect them with our life choices and lifestyle and our character and personality. Because it's not just about education. It's about revealing. And you know who's the greatest teacher of all? Holy Spirit. Jesus was called rabbi, teacher. And the Holy Spirit is the wisdom of God. He gave us the wisdom of God. He sent his spirit. And the word says he will teach us. When we don't know what to say, he will teach us what to say. Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher. He's also the greatest helper to keep us in line with staying true to his commandments, 
his statutes and his ways. Without Holy Spirit, we're going to be so limited. Try cooking in your kitchen Thanksgiving dinner with one arm tied behind your back. It's not easy. It might still be able to be done some degree, but not easy. Without Holy Spirit, your arm and your leg are tied behind your back. Just stand with me. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa. Just position yourself to receive. Father, we just come to you. Can we just do this right now? Can we just, as a body, we commit ourselves? I'm getting a picture of just Joshua taking all of Israel at the bows of the Mount of Ai, and they're just reaffirming their commitment to God. So, Father, we right now, as your family, as a church family, we commit and we dedicate ourselves to you. We recommit to be obedient to your statutes, to your commands, to your principles, <clears throat> and staying true, holding on to your testimonies. We commit right now that this day, We align our hearts with yours, that in the days to come, we will keep our hearts aligned with yours. And we commit to pursue you with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. To love you with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. Knowing that when we do make a mistake, we commit to stand in your cleansing flow and the blood that was spilled on the cross to cover us for your blood covers a multitude of sins and restores us exactly where we're supposed to be. We commit this to you. If you've never received the Holy Spirit, been baptized by Holy Spirit, let's do that right now. Stay in that receiving position. And even if you have, Holy Spirit may just come right now and just touch you. Holy Spirit, come. We just invite you right now to come and touch. If you're open, receive. <coughs> receive. Just come, Holy Spirit. If you start to feel woozy, sit down. Come, Holy Spirit. Come right now. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, come. Come, come, come. Just come and fill this place. Fill the hearts right now. Fill, 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 fill. Fill. Come. for more, Lord. Push more, Lord. ministering to those here. Those of you guys at home, I just release Holy Spirit where you are. Are you listening live or you're listening later? Come, Holy Spirit, just touch. Just touch right now. Break into 
every house, every car, every room. Come, Holy Spirit, come and just touch right now. Refresh, renew, baptize in the name of the Son and Father right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Just release him where you are right now. Thank you, Jesus. More, 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 Lord. More. Fill this place. We need more of you, Jesus. started feeling stress for this season. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I just bind the spirit, the spirit of fret and stress of what's going on. Just bind it right now and just release peace over you that what you do, whatever your responsibilities are, from here till January 1st, that, you, that those responsibilities would be an outflow of your rest with him of you resting in him. I don't care what it looks like, but commit to doing it in his joy. Commit to walking with him through it. If you're feeling stressed, you need to step back. So Father, I just release peace over each person right now. Peace. That we will rejoice this time of year. We will not get caught up in the nonsense. But we walk with you, in love with you, Jesus. You did not give me a spirit of fear. You've given me strength in a sound mind. You teach me how to walk in faith. Resting in the strength that is your name, my teacher, my Lord Jesus, my teacher and my friend.
just going to officially dismiss, pray, and dismiss you all. But if Holy Spirit's still ministering to you, please don't get up and leave. Don't quench what God is doing. We just want God and Holy Spirit to keep blessing and keep touching and refreshing. He's doing something. So, Father, I just thank you for everyone here. I just thank you for this day. I say you touch every heart. And, and Lord, I thank you for revelation to come and awareness, a spirit of awareness of how to better line up our lives with you in obedience to your statutes and commands. Lord, even well after we're gone from this place this morning, Lord, holy revelation in our sleep, in our daily life, that we walk faithfully with you. In Jesus' name.